Um, I just want to share with you today the scripture from 1 Samuel 31 to 20. Um, so let us just um, come in this time to the Lord and then we'll just see if we can share some points that the Lord has laid on my heart regarding this um, lovely and interesting scripture for this opportunity. We can come here to just to thank you and to praise you for what you have done for us. And we come at this time to you that the word of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be accepted to you. And uh, we pray that you will, as John the Baptist pray, that I may decrease and you will increase. And so bless your word to heart and may your name be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder as I share from the theme, go take it back, if you can think of anything in your own life that you have lost be it relationship or finances or maybe goals or dreams or something that has been very precious to you and may have been taken away from you and, or you have lost it. It may or may not necessarily be your fault, but the reality is that you have lost something very precious to you. And we all have decisions to make as to how do we handle life in those situations when the dear and the precious and the special have been taken away from us. And we're just going to look at a few points here and how David handled his situation at Ziklag and what we can actually learn from these and apply to our lives. David's life to this point, he has been the shepherd boy. I'm sure we remember David as a shepherd boy taking care of Jesse's sheep. We can remember him as a rejected son. We can remember how he was not even considered to um, fight Goliath. And he was overlooked at the time when a king was to be chosen. We see the rejection, but we see a prophecy was given over his life. The prophecy that he would be king, even though he had still to go back and to look after sheep for many years, although there was a prophecy over his life. And that's so important because sometimes things may be spoken over lives, but yet it takes time before it comes into maturity and fruition. And it takes a lot of maturity and humility to continue sometimes in the positions where we are, even though we have a prophecy of greatness to come. And humility is required. We see David having slain Goliath. We see the celebration. We see the jealousy of Saul. As the people sang, Saul killed his thousand, but David his tens of thousands. And we saw the jealousy, but we saw also the place in the palace and the friendship of Jonathan and how that ministered to David, especially in crucial times of need. We see him fleeing from Saul, seeking refuge um, in Palestine. We see the compromises as he ran away, even though the prophecy was on his life, yet seeking refuge among the enemy. Com compromises and alliances with the enemy. And David, we see as we come to this point in his life, with 600 men as they seek to join the king's army to fight Israel, they were rejected. And they returned after three days journey to Ziklag, only to find that their, their city was burnt and destroyed. I just want to look at a few points that we can actually learn and apply from this lesson. And the first one I want to point out is that God's appointment can be man's disappointment. So if you want to turn it the other way, man's disappointment can be God's appointment. When David and the, the raiding party came back, they wanted to join in with the king of Philistine because they had been actually in the Negev and in the south of Judah and in Philistine, Palestine area, actually raiding and the king of Palestine thought, of course, that he was fighting on their side. So they had gone to fight with the king of, the, of Palestine, of Philistines, but of course they were not invited to join and of course David was rejected by the king after the commanders reminded him of who David actually was. This is the fellow who had actually um, who had fought the um, Goliath. And now we are not sure which side he's on. But they came back disappointed on three days journey. Some references said probably about um, 80 miles walk. 
and come back to Ziklag. And there was no welcome party for them. There was no home comforts. But to find that the city was burnt and destroyed and their wives and their children taken away. The rejection. But we see that even that situation that David was delivered from a potentially compromising situation. One of having to fight with the king of the Philistines because he would not more likely have to be his personal bodyguard, which would put him in more danger. And also, if, and no doubt, if the Philistines army had captured Israel, then probably David would have to, in that capacity, be the one to slay Saul. And you know how David felt about touching the Lord's anointed. So we see that by virtue of his decision of moving to the Philistine area, that he actually put himself in a position of compromise. And how are you going to de deal with that situation? We see that God came through for him in a tremendous way. Because although he was in that situation of compromise, but God delivered him. And through the disappointment of being rejected, God saved him from that and those decisions. The other way in which God delivered him and made it very easy for him, in a sense, was that by coming back, by being rejected from fighting with the Philistines' army, he got back to Ziklag just in time to handle that crisis which was at hand. So, the disappointment of rejection led to ultimate success. And I wonder sometimes what disappointment have you gone through? And at the time it hurts. But then overall, in the long run, you can look back and say, had not the Lord been on our side, we would have been swallowed up. The steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And we see that from the rejection of Jesse, the rejection of naming him as being a king, as being even suitable to be considered, to be anointed, but the rejection of being suitable to fight Goliath, for the rejection of joining the Philistine army to fight against Israel. And all of those put together could be rather disappointing. But we see the good that will come out of all these rejections. So first point, man's disappointment can be God's appointment. The second point I find is that the enemy tend to attack us at our lowest and most vulnerable moments. The enemy attacks at our most vulnerable moments moment. They preyed on the weak and the vulnerable, the Amalekites. And the enemy attacked David, attacked while David and his 600 men were away. Isn't that something? That the enemy did not come when the full army and the strength of the 600 men were there. But as they were away, they attacked the women and children, plundered, burned, and take away the spoil. The enemy Praise on the weak and attack us in our most vulnerable moment. In the New Testament, the Bible says that it was while men slept that the enemy sowed tears among the wheat. While men slept. It's always in those weak moments. It's always when you're down and discouraged. And when you're sleeping emotionally. When you're tired. When you're drained. When you're burnt out. And those are the moments when you feel rejected and when you feel as if no one is there for you. How are you sleeping today? And in what way could the enemy be attacking whilst we're not at our peak and optimum pressure? While men slept, the enemy attacked and sow the tears among the wheat. And how do you handle your situation when wheat is infected with the tears? And the question was asked, should we pluck them up? As David later asked, should we attack, should we go? And every situation we face in life requires wisdom, isn't it? Some of us may be impulsive and reactive instead of being responsive. We react to situations instead of seeking God as to how do we handle each situation as they come? The question was asked, do we pull up the tears? Do we go? Do we attack? Very important how we handle the Ziklag experiences of our lives. So, but 
as I mentioned earlier on, it doesn't really matter how the situations that we find ourselves in occur. The fact is we are there. We could argue that in David's case, Saul's jealousy contributed in some ways to the situation he was in. It was out of his success and celebrations that the jealousy arose, we could say, and he was being chased with his life threatened. But we could also say that it's also out of David's compromises. Because the prophecy was given of his life that you're going to be great, that you're going to be king of Israel. But then we found that David was actually in a backslidden state and a compromising position to go and to seek refuge in the Negev, in the south, and in the Palestinian, in the Philistine areas. Quite a compromise indeed. So we could argue that to some extent his predicament was due to his own compromise and lack of faith as well. The Amalekite burnt Ziglag and destroyed it, but thankfully no life was lost. And I find from that experience that even in the worst of our situations, that the enemy has limited power in what he can do in our lives. Let's take a look at Job, for example, that even though Job lost everything when God said to the enemy, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. And David and Job, um, the Satan challenged God and said, well, he served you because of his blessings. Your blessings on him. But if you remove everything from him, he will certainly curse you to your face. And God gave permission and said, you can do what you want to do, but don't touch his life. And from that, we see that regardless of what happens to you in your life, the enemy has limited power in so much as God allows. I think that is comforting to know that there's absolutely nothing happening in your life and mine. One, that God doesn't know about. Two, that he did not allow, not cause, but a lot. And in view of that fact, then we can take comfort that there will be ultimate success because he allows it and what he allows, he will deliver us from. And that's absolutely fantastic. The third point. So the first, God, man's disappointment can be God's appointment. Secondly, the enemy attacks us at our most vulnerable moments. Thirdly, take time for healthy grieving in times of disappointment. Take time for healthy grieving in times of disappointment. How do you handle disappointments? How do you handle distress? And when your ziklag, and when your life turns upside down in your relationships, financially, and in your health. And whatever the circumstance may be that you have to grapple with, how do you handle these situations? David and his soldiers came back, and when they beheld the desolation and the destruction, the Bible says that they cried out aloud. They cried out, then they wept aloud, and then they went to silent grief. And I find that progression quite interesting from that cry of exclamation, of disbelief, of uh, that cry of guilt. Probably that we were not there. How would things have been different if only we had been here? Weeping aloud and silent grief. I suppose that there is a stage in our lives when so great can be the grief that there are no tears left to cry. So great can be the grief that we don't have the strength for tears. I believe a very crucial point of emotional well-being and mental health is when one gets to that place of silence. It's one thing when one is talking, but silence doesn't necessarily mean that all is well. It could be a state of grief that is beyond words. As David and his men, they cried and sat there in silence. The Bible specifically they know that David the leader grieved as well. All the pressures that leaders face. The agony and the silent frustration that sometimes you don't know who to talk to, you don't know who to trust, you don't know who to confide in and who can handle the strength of your grief. Because 
Other people are concerned about their situation because the Bible says that yet they threatened to stone him. Notwithstanding, David was going through the same or even greater pressure. But the 600 men sought to stone him. And while David was going through his own grief, he had lost his wife, he had lost his family as well. Plus, no doubt he has lost faith and face as a leader. You have led them away. You have led them back, and now here's what happened. There's a greater pressure on him as a leader. But the people couldn't see that, so what we're going to do, we're going to start gathering some stones because it's your fault. Never mind the fact that you are in the same predicament as us. I believe there's something interesting about when men cry. When men cry. And this is so because within our society and culture and even wider field in the world, men are raised, boys are raised not to show much emotion. And you hear phrases like, suck it up, take it like a man. Big men don't cry. And it's quite interesting because when you have been socialized that way, and then now you become adults, and then your spouse starts to say, show your tender side. And the poor men are saying, which one? <laughs> you know, you have been brought up all your life to be tough, to take things. You're walking down the park with your papa. You hit your toe and the stone is bleeding. And they say, suck it up, just continue like nothing happened. You see, there's something about men, when men cry and when men go into silent grief. And this is so because the statistics in this country and it's so far the places that the biggest killer of men aged 20 to 50 is suicide. And I say this in passing, that when men cannot trust, because someone says when women talk of trust, they talk of fidelity. When a man talks of trust, they talk mainly about the ability to find respect. Someone who can know their secrets and respect them in the morning. Someone who can know their secrets and not use it against them to win an argument later on. Someone who can know when they pour their heart out to them, they won't use it against them later on and manipulate it for their own purposes. It's a, it's a serious thing to find someone to trust. And because of that, sometimes, we find that men remain silent. And it's a dangerous place to be because the, the, the whole need for, some people talk about accountability partner or a friend, and most people have a fan but not a friend. And I don't think that social media helps anyway because people tend to be looking every day for likes. How many people like me? Or how many people are your friends? Well, they're not your friends, they don't know them. They may be fans following you. But then when it comes to the level of intimacy, in terms of the depth of one's sharing, someone defines intimacy as into me see, into me see. Who can these 600 men really talk to and open up to? And who could David talk to at the moment when he was filled with grief? And when, of course, they wanted to stone him. But amidst all that, there's a time when mourning is over. A time for healthy grieving, but there comes a time when grieving should be over. We can't go and cry about Ziklag. At some point, yes, the city is burnt. Yes, our wives and families are gone. Yes, our position has been plundered. Yes, we have lost a job. Yes, our loved ones have dementia. And yes, our kids have turned out not the way we raised them. Yes, the grandkids have not turned out the way we raised them. Yes, they turn around and say that you were there for them even though you gave everything you could give, but there comes a time when grieving is over. And David and his men had two different attitudes because the Bible says that the attitude of the soldiers was of anger, bitterness, and resentment. We're going to start gathering some stones. Somebody's going to pay for this. Stones are being gathered. You're the leader. We're going to start with you. But David showed resilience and deep reflection. And the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. So when you are surrounded by 600 people who should be there for you in your moment of need, and the most they can talk about is how they're going to stone you and criticize you. But David in the earlier time says, Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? 
Hope thou in God. The woman with the issue of blood had to also talk to herself. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Now she said it again and again unto herself. What are you saying to yourself? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. If you keep saying negative things over yourself, I can't do it, I can't be bothered, life is boring, this is killing me, this disease is going to kill me. That's how you're talking, life and death in the power of your tongue. You're not snared by the words of others, you're snared by the words of your own mouth. You've got to speak the words, speak the words that you want to create your world. As God spoke, let there be light, let there be. What are you saying to yourself? Are you saying, let there be disaster and disease and sickness? What are you saying? Let there be what? Fill in the blanks. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I tell you this, that if you don't encourage yourself in the Lord, sometimes there's nobody there to encourage you. What are you going to do? Fall under and get into depression and agony and grief and mental illness and whatever. 600 men, not one person to stand and put their hand on the shoulder and say, Leader, I understand. You meant well. You didn't call this on yourself. You're leading all of us. Furthermore, you're in this together. We're all in this together. No. Let's gather some stones. That's what's going to happen to you. When you pour your life out for people, when you encourage others, and now you encourage everybody else, now you go home discouraged. You have got to seek help within yourself. I tell you this. And I'm not saying this that you are to be in any way prideful. But I'm saying you have got to reach a stage where the help that you get and the encouragement that you get from others really is the icing on the cake. And in case it doesn't come, you encourage yourself in the Lord. Isn't that what the book of Jude said? Building up your faith or your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. And there's a time when you have got to pray in the Holy Ghost for yourself. But the interesting thing that happens, I find, is that whilst he encouraged himself in the Lord, next point, seek God before your decisions are made. Seek God before your decisions, then go with courage. Because because David encouraged himself in the Lord, he was able to minister to the other 600 men. Now he went and he sought the Lord because whilst the other men were being resentful and angry and gathering stone, David was seeking the Lord. And he asked of the Lord, should we pursue them, will we catch them? Isn't that interesting? So seek God before your decisions are made. What do we do sometimes? We make our decisions in a very reactive way. Then when we get into trouble, we call the whole church to fast and pray and we call the National Day of Prayer for the bad decisions I make. And there's a place for mercy and grace. But how much better if we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then the other things will be added rather than reacting. Because sometimes we do tend to react instead of standing back, reflect, then respond. So God said, after he called for the priest, and bring the ephod and let's see God, and the word of the Lord says, go after them, you will catch them, and certainly rescue your family. Isn't that wonderful? So the word of affirmation, you certainly, beyond the shadow of a doubt, you will. That's what it says in Psalm 126, I said, that he that goes forth weeping shall doubtless come again, bringing the sheaves with him. You go forth weeping now, that's fine. Go forth and weep now. Cry now if you must. You have lost a lot. It hurts. But the Bible says that beyond the shadow of a doubt, you will come again, bringing the sheaves with you, rejoicing. Then those among the nations will have to say, the Lord has done great things for them. We are off. We are glad. Then you join in and say, the Lord indeed has done great things for us. We are off. We are glad. So what did the Lord say? Say this with me. Go catch rescue. Say that with me. Go catch rescue. rescue. Those are the words of God. Go catch and rescue. And with those words, David was able to go back to the, 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 the men with courage and with confidence, with a word from God, and, and, and seek to go after them. So what I say to you in life, don't act independent of God, because when emotion is high, judgment is low. 
You don't act when you're angry. You don't act when you're fearful. Because those are high emotions and you make bad decisions. The next point, just to recap the other few. So one, man's disappointment can be God's appointment. The enemy attacks us at our most vulnerable moments. Number three, take time for healthy grieving. And number four, seek God before your decisions and then go with courage. Point number five. God's given directions and promises still require action and a strategy for a success. Even though you have got no word, go catch rescue. Go where? Rescue how? Rescue who? There still needs to be a strategy. So this new encouragement that David got, um, it gives purpose and faith to inquire the soldiers and to inspire them. And these men who are going to stone him, now they are inspired because their leader has this new sense of strength and vision and purpose from the Lord. And there there were no more talk of stoning. No more talk of stoning. But in the midst of that interesting turn, I find another interesting point. And that is the fickleness of human nature. That at one point, when things are not going well, People are quick to draw stones and gather stones. The fickleness of human nature. Hosanna, but then crucify him. And if you don't develop that sense of strength and resilience, you find you're going to be very disappointed in life. Because people, they can be there with you one minute and gone the next. So, they, as they walked along the path, they find that there were 200 men of the 600 that could not go along. They were worn out by their grief. They were tired. They were discouraged. They were faint. 200 of them. But we find that they stood there and they were guarding the supplies. So although they did not have the strength, remember they too have gone the, what, six days journey, return journey, they came back and beheld the desolation. They did not necessarily have the wherewithal to continue to the front line. But they watched the supplies and facilitated the army of 400 to continue into the battle to retrieve the plunder and the spoils. What I find is that they, we all have different talents and abilities, don't we? Paul plants Apollos water, but the increase comes from God. So, not everyone who started with you in life will finish with you. Not everybody will see your vision. Not everybody will have this sense of purpose. Not everyone in life will see what you see. And we have to get used to sometimes in going alone, understanding that people can only go so far and no further. But if you have been told to go catch rescue, you have the sense of vision and purpose. You have to be comfortable enough in your skin to continue on with what does say the Lord, even though some will falter by the wayside. Next point, quickly. Be mindful of the process along the path to your goals. Be mindful of the process. Sometimes we are so concerned about the outcome, especially in this outcome-driven, target-driven culture. We are not concerned about people. We are not concerned about what happens along the, the way. We are just concerned. Just tick the boxes, get the targets, get the outcome, get the output, and we are efficient. So there was David and his men, and as they walked along to recover the spoils, the Bible says that there was a wounded, abandoned Egyptian soldier. And David's reaction changed because he could have killed the, 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 this person, especially when he heard that he was a part of the raiding party that had destroyed and taken away their families. But when it, it was brought to David's attention of the young man, what they did, they fed him, they gave him, um, they nursed him back to health after his three days and three nights, being abandoned, left without food, they gave him fig cake, and they nursed him back to life, as said before, and David's wrath was controlled. Instead of taking revenge on this soldier, he actually used him to help locate the enemy. God is going to provide unexpected help to you in your time of need. But to do that, you can't ignore the less simple we find along the path. Because we don't know who is one who God may use to bless you as you go towards your goals this year. 
Because the persons that we ignore along the path could be those who the Lord will use to, to take us to our victory. So, we find that they surprised the enemy as the young man led them to victory. Of course, on two conditions. One, don't kill me. And two, don't hand me over to the army because I'm, I'm a whistleblower. And the David fought and got the victory over the Amalekites. They were caught off guard, partying, and they surprised the enemy. Can you surprise the enemy with your faith? Whatever the enemy has taken away from you last year, this year, can you, instead of getting ready to stone people and becoming angry and resentful and bitter, can you surprise the enemy with your faith? There they were, he calls afar on the head of your enemy. Rejoice in tribulation. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. Rescue. That's what God promised. And the Bible says that and David um, recovered all. And the scripture says that you will recover the years at one. Well. The canker worm, the locust, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, all those creepy crawly things on your life. Everything you have lost. Go back for it. Whatever you have lost. Go back with a vengeance for the kingdom suffereth violence and the violent taketh it by force. Don't sit down and say, well, what well, okay, sera, sera, what will be, will be. Ah, that's life. That's how life works sometimes. You know, we win some, we lose some. No! No! Go back for it. What have you lost? What have you lost? Your children. Go pray for them. Your education. You didn't go back to school. Go to a course. You didn't write those books. Dr. Miles Monroe, the late Dr. Miles Monroe of the Bahamas said, one of the most, uh, the wealthiest place in the world is not the, the, the diamond fields of Africa. It's not the oil fields of the Middle East. He says, no, the richest place on the earth is essential. For therein lies the goals and the dreams that were never realized, the books that were never written, the songs that were never written. The businesses that were never started. Alas, the richest place on earth, he concludes, is this cemetery. But what is it that we have lost? What is it that have been taken away from us? However, so ever caused, whether by the jealousy or the pains or the rejection of others or through the carelessness, the, the compromises of our own life or the fears that we have had that we never step out to achieve something. Wish you well and I thank you for the opportunity to minister. And I just pray that you will never give up, but at whatever happens, you will seek to encourage yourself in the Lord, not in your strength, not in others, because as I say, others will fail, but encourage yourself in the Lord. Let's pray. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word to us today, and we pray your blessing upon us as you will just Minister to us, give us the grace and strength to hear from you. Go catch, rescue, and recover all that we have lost. And we trust you, Lord, that you'll come to lead and bless your word to our hearts. Um, it will be a rhema word that we can use to encourage our own hearts, or whatever our situation may be, for this new year. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.